So welcome to the IG Resume Workshop. This is our first professional development workshop of the fall quarter. Um, and it is a cool event code sponsored by Thermo Fisher. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. But anywho, uh, hopefully we've all signed in these QR codes or this um, link. And if you haven't, I believe it has been dropped in the chat at some point. If someone could drop that again, that'd be fantastic. And we will just go ahead and get started. All right. So you might have noticed that I started recording at some point if you were in the waiting room for a while. Uh, we wanted to make this available to more people than could actually make this specific time. So we're recording it and putting it on YouTube. If you're uncomfortable with that, if you don't unmute at any point, you won't appear in the recording at all. It'll just be my face and whoever is speaking. Um, so yeah, if you don't want to appear in the recording at all, totally fine. Just be aware that if you don't talk, you won't be in the recording. Okay, so our agenda is to talk about Aichi, to talk about niche, talk about thermal pressure for a little bit, and then we're going to go into the actual workshop. So there's kind of a lot of a lot of things happening before the actual workshop. Apologies for that. Um, but it's all good things, so hopefully we'll have fun. So we'll talk about why you need a resume, why it's important, and how you can make it absolutely fantastic. And then we're going to do a bit of workshopping. We'll, we'll do um, if you have a resume, we're going to do critiques, and if you don't have a resume, we will help you get one. So first, what is IG? So IG stands for the American Institute of Chemicals Engineers, and we are the UC San Diego chapter. These are two of our alumni. We don't have very many current pictures because everything's been on Zoom, but this is a very fun one that I found in our archives. Um, and they look like they're doing some sort of outreach program. That's something that we like to do a lot. But essentially what we're doing is we are dedicated to promoting professional development of UCSD students, particularly chemical engineering students, and we are also dedicated to fostering a welcoming and supportive community among um, our members. So basically, we're just a whole big family helping each other be awesome chemical engineers and save the world in the process, you know, whatever you want to do. We have a whole bunch of events and a whole type, whole many types of events. Uh, so we have, this is a picture of uh, the AS ASML conference room, which is where we used to have all of our meetings before COVID happened, and hopefully we'll have them there again eventually. So we have things here like networking events, professional development events like this workshop and other things like that, uh, information sessions with companies, etc. We also have really fun events like this is our bonfire. We're probably having that in person this year, I believe. So that's super exciting. That's coming up I think next week. So keep your eye on that one. We also have uh, this, <laughs> this is a, a picture of an event where we tried to stack apples and bananas together and it was quite a nightmare. It was very hard, but um, we got through it. And that was part of our mentorship program. So our mentorship program pairs upper division engineers with lower division engineers, and they talk about how to make your life better at UCSD, basically. It's really great. And I highly encourage you to join if you haven't already. Um, we also do uh, events. This is with family, but we also do just general social events. So I think this one is going to some sort of it was like jumping palace places. We do all sorts of fun events, lots of games and things like that. It's a good time. And then these two pictures are when we went on company tours. And we haven't because COVID has been, we'll be starting again soon. Let's see. So we have um, several cool programs. I did mention one of them, but we have three in particular that I want to mention. First is IT projects, where we um, you have to join a project team and you work to solve relevant and relevant issues. We have several teams that are working on wastewater treatment, multiple working on energy generation, and they're all very unique and very fun. It's a great learning experience and a great way to get hands-on experience in a way that your classes don't quite let you. And it's uh, very different from a lab because you're doing things in a way that um, like it's not predetermined. No one's telling you what to do, you have to figure it out. So it's a good, really good learning experience. I did mention family, that's our mentorship program. And it has a record of creating meaningful and long lasting friendships. I am still in contact with my mentor from freshman year and we're going out for tacos next weekend. I'm very excited. So if you would like to have a relationship like that with someone at UCSD, um, that is definitely an option for you. And then next I'd like to mention IG committee. And this is basically a subset of our officers board where that helps us make the magic happen, or at least our events happen. And we'll be having some committee um, applications come up in the new future. So if you think IG is awesome, I recommend you sign up for the committee. And then I want to talk about our biggest event of the year. That is 
the Nano and Chemical Engineering Exhibition, or as I, we like to call it for short, Niche, um, because we like to say you get to find your niche at Niche. Um, so anyways, this has three parts. It includes an innovative solutions competition, which is a uh, pitching competition that's done on a hackathon style. So it's just, um, it's only three days long, basically. You get three days to do everything and then it's over and there's lots of cash prizes and it's very exciting and very fun. We have some good keynote speakers coming. I'm very excited. And then our, probably our biggest attraction is the career fair. There are 15 plus companies, I think we have 16 now. And these are all companies that want to hire chemical engineers specifically, which I think is fantastic because most of the career fairs on campus focus on other majors like business majors or CS majors or mechanical engineers. So chemical engineers and nano engineers don't get as much love in the career fair as we made our own. And then there's also a grad school fair, which we're still figuring out the details on. But right now we have, I think at least four grad schools that are interested in coming and they'll be talking about how you can apply and um, yeah, just how to get into their school if you are interested in going on to a degree past your bachelor's. So there are a few details here and we'll be, I have a hyperlink here. I'll post the slides probably on Facebook afterwards, but this will be available. Anyways, for the Innovative Solutions Competition, you can register at this link and that will be due by 6 p.m. on the 20th, which I believe is Wednesday. The kickoff event will be on Thursday, the 21st, 6 to 7 p.m. You'll have 72 hours to basically do everything from meeting your team members to coming up with a solution to the problem statement and then creating a presentation for it. And then on Sunday, October 24th from 3 to 5 p.m., you'll be pitching that to a panel of judges and then you'll give it. This will happen both virtually, uh, this is sorry, this will happen virtually both on Zoom and Discord. The career fair will be happening on Wednesday, October 27th, 1 to 4 p.m. Mark your calendars because that date is not changing. This will be happening virtually, one Zoom link per company, and we will be telling you more details about that in the future communications from IG. Grad school fair, um, again, it'll be virtual. It will have only one or two Zoom links. We're keeping this one a little simpler. And it will also be on Wednesday, the 27th, and it's going to be later in the day, 6 to 8 p.m. So right before we get into the workshop, I just want to take a second to talk about Thermo Fisher Scientific, the sponsor for this event. Um, in all transparency, I am a campus ambassador for them. I interned with them this summer and they offered me to be their ambassador for this year, which means that it is my job to communicate to lots of people who might want to work at Thermo Fisher someday about how cool the company is and just help them get connected so they can get internships, co-ops, and just full-time positions. So, um, Thermo Fisher, what is that? It is the world leader in serving science. Their mission is to enable customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer, which I think is just great. Don't we all want a healthy, cleaner, and safer world? Anyways, they make things like my pets, lab chemicals, microscopes. Um, my particular site that I worked at made a lot of dyes. You can see like what's inside of a cell, which is pretty cool. There's some beautiful pictures. They were also um, very involved in the COVID response, making tests and vaccines and things like that. So that's pretty cool. But anyways, to make all of those things and work towards that mission, they need a lot of talented people like you. They hire a lot of chemical engineers because they do a lot of chemical stuff. Um, so they definitely need our skill set, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of opportunities with Thermo Fisher. For example, internships. This is for people who are currently students. These are 10 to 12 weeks in summer. They are paid, which is fantastic. I was paid almost $20 an hour, which is good stuff for an internship. Um, you get a cool project to work on, exposure to the core company processes, technology, and leaders. You get to do a ton of networking. It's fantastic. And it's like, a, yeah, networking connections. Great way to kickstart your career at Thermo Fisher. And they are currently recruiting through fall and winter quarter. So if you are interested in doing an internship, feel free to contact me and I will find all the right things for you. Their leadership development programs are specifically for people who are graduating this year. That's our current seniors. Um, these are a two-year program where you rotate through multiple roles and sites. It's basically networking and learning on speed. And so you get to do a ton of things and you kind of get uh, like fast-tracked to a managerial role, which is pretty cool. So yeah, you become an awesome leader at Thermo Fisher way into the program. And most of the recruiting does happen in fall quarter. So if you're interested in that, also feel free to reach out directly to me and I will get you more information. And of course, there's direct hire opportunities, but that's for people who are graduating or have graduated. And those are always recruiting. There's really no time scale for that. 
anyways, if you're interested in Thermo, feel free to um, apply for the physicians at jobs.thermofisher.com or scan this QR code. And if you are just interested in more information, follow me on Instagram. I, like I said, I'm a campus ambassador and feel free to DM me if you are interested in more specific information for you. So yes, with all that said, we are finally getting to resumes. And I have to give a huge shout out to this particular link. I don't know exactly how to credit them, but I got a lot of my tips from them because I didn't need to reinvent the wheel if they already had it. Um, but anyways, here we go. So what is a resume? A resume is a short account of experiences, qualifications, and achievements with the goal of showing an employer that you are a good fit for a role. So basically a resume is like your first impression to a potential employer saying, I want this job and I'm going to be fantastic for it. So hopefully if that resume does its job, it will get you an interview, which is then your next step into going on to be hired, which is the goal of this whole process. This is an example of, I just Googled like an example of, um, what do you call it? Like an engineering resume and this is what came up. I have a few problems with it, but it's for the most part pretty good. It's got, you know, all the sections that you want. The name is big, you can see it. There's lots of words here that look pretty important. All that good stuff. Anywho, we'll talk more about all this in a second. There's typical sections of a resume. There is your name and contact information. That's the most important part. We'll be talking about that first. The objective and career profile, which is technically optional. I've actually never used one, um, but you can definitely put that in there if you'd like. Your education experience, that can be work, volunteering, extracurriculars, and kind of anything that fits into like, I do this with my time that is an education. Um, and then your skills is the last part. So contact information. This is important because you want them to remember who you are, not just there was someone in the crowd who did a thing that made them qualified for this. They want them to remember you did the thing that was qualified that made you fantastic for this job. So you wanna make your name really big, like significantly bigger than anything else on the page. Um, and your contact information is important because if you're giving a recruiter your, your resume in person, they won't have your email on file anywhere. So this is how they're going to get a hold of you. So you want to include your email address, make sure it's professional, not, you know, I don't know, pink unicorns 85 or something like that. Make sure it's like, you know, your first name, your last name at gmail or whatever.com. Um, I recommend you adding your LinkedIn because that is like your resume, but longer and more detailed. So if the recruiter is interested, they can go on to that and just see kind of like more about things they can get Kind of a better picture about who you are and uh if you don't have a linkedin contact me i can help you with that we'll have a workshop on that one later probably in winter quarter but uh, if you do have one feel free to put that on there phone number i sometimes put that on there sometimes don't um because uh the thing about putting your phone number and address actually let me talk about address first don't put your address on your resume and why I say phone number is optional to my resume, those two kind of go together, is because if you're handing this out in person, there's a chance that you know the recruiter could drop it and some random person could pick it up that you didn't want to know your phone number or your address. So I would recommend not putting your address on and only putting your phone number on there if you are okay with getting spam calls. <laughs> so yeah, always put your name and contact information at the top of your resume because that is where everyone expects to see it and that's where they want to know how to contact you. So next part is your objective or career profile. Like I said, I've never used this, so I'm not actually a very good source for this. So I'm just taking this straight from those slides that I uh, had on online. The objective is a short statement that includes the job title you want and the main reason why they should consider you for the position. Um, I'd say this is very good for if you're, if you really want one job in particular, you would use an objective to say, this is what I want, this is why you should hire me. And that makes it easier for the recruiters to say, oh, okay, you know, that works out for me and maybe we can look into this further, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And then you get hired, it's great, maybe. Um, and then the career profile is a short paragraph that highlights your experience and qualifications that make you a match for the position you want. So that's a little more general. It's kind of like a summary of your resume at the very top of your resume, um, which I think is a little strange because your resume is only a page long anyways, but eh, you know, if it works for you, it works for you. If you want more information on these, I would recommend Googling that because like I said, I'm not the best source for it. All right, so education. This is really important to us because we are currently in the midst of our education. So you'll want to list the degrees that you're working towards and 
the degrees that you've achieved, depending on which ones they are. You'll want to include the school and its city and state, usually, and the year that you will graduate or did graduate. You can also include any minors or areas of specialization if you have the room for it and if they're applicable to the job. Uh, you can, if you graduated with honors or something like that, you can include that. And you're always going to, well, I forgot to list your GPA. You want to put your GPA on there if it's good. If it's not good, don't put it on there. <laughs> and good is defined kind of by like the, the job description itself. It will often say, you know, 2.5 GPA required or 2.7 GPA required, something like that. So if you're above that, definitely put it on there. If you're below that, don't put it on there. <laughs> and just kind of a note about the and city and state part, you don't need to list that for our school because it literally includes the city and the state in the name. So you don't need to write it again. But if you were from, you know, I don't know, I can't think of these numbers. Anyway, uh, college students, we don't want to include our high school diploma in your education because if you're in college already, you kind of, it's kind of assumed that you went to high school, which is fantastic. Everyone who graduates from high school, high five. Um, but you don't need to include that in your education. It's just not as interesting to recruiters as it was to your college recruiter people. But if you are in grad school, do include your undergraduate education. I don't know why they do that, but it's a thing. Anyways, experience. This is arguably the most important part of your resume besides the contact information. So if you have worked, put that on there. <laughs> if you're involved in extracurriculars like Aichi or SWE or like pretty much anything, put that on there. If you volunteer somewhere, you can put that on there. Um, if you are involved in enough things and have done enough things, only include what's relevant for the job that you're applying for. So like example, if you're applying for an engineering job, you might not want to put that you were the um, I don't know, volunteer coordinator for PetSmart or something. Like it's just not particularly relevant to what you're doing. But if you if volunteering at PetSmart is the only thing that you did, feel free to put that on there. Like everything is relevant if you can spin it the right way. Um, what you want to do is you always want to adjust language to match the job description. That's what I was talking about with spinning things the right way. Um, and in particular, you want to spin things by using the words in the actual job description. And what that does is if a lot of people are applying to this job, they're not, like the people who are looking at these resumes aren't going to look at every resume. They're going to put it through a system that will kind of scan for the keywords that they want in this person that they're going to hire. So if you use the words from the job description in your resume, you are more likely to have an actual person look at your resume, which is always a good step towards getting hired. All right, so we want to use strong action verbs and numbers when we can. We will talk more about that later. Um, but basically that means instead of saying, uh, I can't think of an example, I'm sorry. It's been a while since I've done this, my apologies. But anyways, you want to use strong action verbs like um, led a team of eight people. That's a good example. So this is a strong action verb, that's the lead. I, I led this team and the number is how many people did you lead? I led eight people. And that and then you can expand on that you know what did you leave them on doing all that kind of thing so general statement structure is going to be what you did the skills you used and the impact that you had and so that's kind of pairing with this above statement so that's say i led a team of eight people so i led a team of eight people to um what did we do uh <laughs> um we did experiments to remove phosphorus from wastewater and the impact is that we we discovered that we could use this particular technique to remove like 90% of phosphorus from wastewater, something like that. Um, another point is that you want to put your experiences in a reverse chronological order. So that means that if you did an internship last year and an internship the year before, you're going to want to put your most recent internship before the one that you did less recently. <laughs> I can word, I promise. So that's just typical, typically how things are ordered. They want to see what you've been up to more recently than what you did a long time ago, because we all know that we forget things very quickly, especially after the final is over. Anyways, uh, you also want to avoid using experiences from long ago. For college students, that means pretty much anything that you did in high school. Um, there are exceptions for that. If you are a freshman, like this is your first quarter here. First of all, welcome. We're really excited that you're here. And second, 
you don't have anything else to put on there. So if you're applying for a job on campus, say, put stuff that you did in high school. But by the end of your first year, you're gonna to wanna to start phasing out the things that you did in high school because people are more interested in what you did in college. And I know that's sad because to get here, I'm sure we all did a million things in high school and really put our heart and soul into it. I was very sad to take things off my resume that I did in high school. But anyways, just, that just means that you get to do new and other fun things in college and put that on your resume instead. For seniors, you should absolutely not be putting things on your resume from high school unless it was really, really relevant to what you were doing. Like, for example, I had this really great opportunity to work in a lab while I was in high school. So sometimes I put that on my resumes if I'm applying for a more research based thing. Otherwise, I'll take it off. It's from 2017, it's so long ago. I feel old. Anywho, skills. This is probably the last part of your resume because it kind of fits nicely as like a, you know, I have like three lines left. What do I do with it? This is what you want to be, you want to tell your recruiters what you can do besides what you've just told them in your experience. So ideally your experience will show all of your skills, but having a skills section separate will just kind of make it a little easier for the, for the recruiters to see, oh, you know, they can do this and this and this. You want to want to emphasize the ones that are relevant to the job. So you can either put those first or bold them or kind of remove other ones, you know, whatever's going to make them more, um, more emphasized is what you can do. If you have room, you can include slightly less relevant skills. Um, that's kind of like if you just need, if you have like one more line, you're like, I don't know what to put, you can put another line of skills that are like, eh, I mean, eh, they could maybe want that. Like maybe I did public speaking class. Like that's, that's kind of a good skill. You want to avoid familiar your resume with fluffy skills. And it's a little hard to define what a fluffy skill is, but it's kind of along the lines of, team player or organized because recruiters are kind of going to assume that you are a team player and you are at least somewhat organized because you got to this career fair with your resumes in hand. Not everyone does that. I didn't do that once. Oops. <laughs> um, so they're going to assume a few things. So you don't need to put these kind of uh, unnecessary skills. If you, but if you have time, if you like have space, that you just don't know what to do with, you can have a few of those in there, but don't let them, don't let these fluffy skills take up a whole lot of room in your resume. It just makes it look like you don't have anything else, which is absolutely untrue. You have so many things to offer. So for engineering jobs, you do want to include things like coding language that you know. So for us, that's MATLAB because we all know MATLAB. If you know anything else, put those on there. If you know any lab equipment, definitely put those on there as well. I applied to one job and they sent me my resume back with like highlights on it. And they were like, oh, you know how to use an HPLC and a mass spectrometer. And I was like, oh yes, good thing I put that on there. That got me an interview. Um, so you want to include those. And if it's like non-lab equipment, I can't think of anything at the moment, but I'm if you're in a non-lab position, but there is equipment involved with that, uh, you know, judgment call. If you think it'd be relevant, put it on there. You can put other things on your resume if you just need to fill up a little bit of space, things like certifications. Six Sigma is kind of a lean manufacturing thing, like it's a way to think kind of, you already learn as an engineer, but it's like an extra certification, I don't know, that's a whole thing. Um, professional engineer is something you can do after you graduate, or I think maybe before you can, it will just kind of test you to make sure that you are actually thinking like an engineer and things like that. First day of the CPR train? I don't know. If it's relevant for some reason, go ahead and put it on there. You can include awards and recognitions, including scholarships. So for example, if you got a scholarship, you can put that on there. If you got, you know, uh, in the 10th percent, 10, top 10 percent of your class, you can put that on there, something like that. Uh, publications are fantastic to put on your resume if you are applying for something scientific-ish. Uh, and you don't have to wait until it's actually published because you know most of the work actually happens way before it's even published. So if you, it's not quite published yet, like it's, if you submitted it to the journal but it's not published yet, write submitted for publication and just don't write the journal. Then. If you have room for it, you can write group memberships if they are widely recognizable. So for example, Aichi is an international organization. Lots of chemical engineers know what it is. So you can write, I was part of Aichi on your resume if you think that would help you get a job. Same with Society of Women Engineers, Professional Greek Life, um, things like that. Uh, you can include the relevant classes that you've taken, but I would recommend against it because it's kind of, the people who are hiring you 
probably know what classes you've taken already, just based on where you are in your education and what degree you're in, and just kind of what you've talked about already. So this is kind of a filler that I would recommend avoiding if you can, but if you really do need to fill up space on your resume, you can fill that up there. All right, formatting a resume. I know that was a lot of words that we already talked about and we have more to go, but for a resume, you want to keep your words short. You want to have one, it be one page long, maybe two pages. And I mean one page, like the front side of a page, not front and back. So the two pages would be a front and back and that's, that's a big maybe. So you want this to be as short as possible. Um, you want to use bullet points, be concise. Do not do paragraphs or text blocks. The recruiters, they're really skimming over this really, really fast. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, if they see a text block, they're just not going to read any of it. You want to use font that's um, 10 to 12 point. And you're going to want to use things that are easy to read in conventional Arial, Times of the Roman, Verdana, and Tahoma are good choices if you're just starting out. I've used a fun font that I found that's pretty similar to Times Room, but slightly different. It makes me feel special. If you find one like that, go ahead and use it as long as it's easily readable. You can use bolding, underlining, and italicizing in your resume as long as you use it consistently. If you use it inconsistently, it will confuse the recruiter and that just isn't helpful. Um, also, don't go overboard on it because that will make it harder to read. You want to take up pretty much as much of the page as you can without making the page look overly crowded. So that is very much a balanced statement as it is. Um, basically, what you want to do is you want to avoid having like a whole bunch of white space in any one particular area. But it's good to have a little bit of white space sprinkled throughout so that the resume is uh, spaced in a way that is actually readable and not just a huge text block, as I mentioned, just up here. So it's a good, it's a good um, kind of graphic design thing to keep in mind is how much white space you have and how it's where it is. So using colors is a thing. This is a reference from Legally Blonde. If anyone's seen that, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's very funny. Um, but anyways, uh, this person in Legally Blonde gives someone her resume and he and she says it's sun, it's pink and it's scented. It gives it that extra something, don't you think? And I think that's just the most charming thing ever. Would I ever put my resume on pink paper? like hot pink paper? Probably not, <laughs> but you can use colors in ways that um, really make the resume stand out from a black and white one. So like it, pretty much for the most part, you're going to be printing black text on white paper, and that is what people expect, and it's professional, so you will do that for the most part. However, a splash of color here and there can make your resume more visually interesting and kind of stand out. So my personal recommendation is that you choose one, maybe two colors, probably keep them darker, so like blue, green, or purple. I saw one person use pink text, and I was like, ooh, that's a little hard to read, a little unprofessional, but okay, I mean, you go for it. Um, and I would recommend just splashing that across the page just a little bit, don't go overboard, don't make everything blue, don't make everything green, it'll look a little strange, but just a little bit is good. And then here's a tip that my mentor gave me when I was a freshman. Um, what you can do is you can print your resume on slightly thicker paper, like semi cardstock kind of paper, or if we make it um, slightly off white, so it's a little bit gray, a little bit beige, or like a very light pastel, it just makes it stand out just a little bit more from everyone else's. And the thicker paper um, just feels nice to touch. So when the recruiter picks it up, they'll immediately, like, they'll have a kinesthetic um, good reaction to it. So just something to keep in mind if you ever go to an in person career fair. <laughs> So this is a quote that was in those slides that I'm more or less copying from. Um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And that's, I mean, it's true. The first time you meet someone is the first time you meet someone unless they don't remember you, then that's the first time that you'll get to make your first impression. And the only time you'll make your first impression. So you want it to be good. And that is what your resume needs to do. So you want to make your resume as good as possible so that you have the best first impression as you can. And you also need your resume to be eye-catching um, because a resume, uh, sorry, a recruiter spends an average of six to seven seconds on a resume. And keep in mind, that's an average. So there are some employers spending like two seconds on a resume, which is kind of scary. Um, basically, the job of your resume is to, uh, or not the job of it, but like one function of your resume is to make the recruiter stop and look just a little bit longer because the longer they spend on your resume is, it doesn't directly relate to you getting an interview, but it's probably more likely. And like I mentioned before, you want to tailor your resume to the job description. 
And that is for the purpose of getting past the scanning programs into an actual human if you're just submitting your resume to a data bank. Why did I write that twice? I don't know. <laughs> um, so basically make your resume as amazing as possible and proofread it at least three times. Proofreading is so important and that is part of why we want to do these critiques today. Anyways, uh, yes, you can also ask anyone, literally anyone who is willing to help you, ask them to proofread it for you. Just be like, you can go up to random people in the library and be like, hey, can you just like read this real quick? Just tell me if anything's off. It's super easy. Okay. So for an example, we're just gonna go through my resume real quick. And I might ask for your, um, yeah, let's ask for some feedback in the chat. So this is my resume. Um, this is one that I used to apply for one of the leadership development programs that I mentioned that Bermuda Fisher offers. And um, you'll notice a few things about it, but I want a few first impressions. So in the chat, uh, what are a few things that you notice about it that are good or bad or that stand out to you? Love the green. Love, okay, good. <laughs> so yeah, the green is something that I've used. I've kept this general kind of template ever since I got to UCSD. Um, I think the, the green is just a really nice way to organize it and make it just a little bit clearer where, what is what and where are the particular sections of this resume. Um, but like I mentioned in the other slide, it's not overboard. It's like, maybe 20 words. <laughs> so it's really not much. And let's see, anything, what else do you, what else does anyone see on here? Anything that they have questions about? Anything that they think is interesting? Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I did write a few things, bold and differences in font. I do like, yes, that's also a very good, and use of numbers, very good. So the bolding is uh, important because you want people to know what what was your job title, basically. Um, so what I do is I do bolding for my job title, and then I do this italicized stuff for where I worked, the company, and like where I was physically. Because for some reason, people want to know that. I don't entirely know why, but eh, whatever. <laughs> and then everything else is more or less plain text. You can put maybe one or two bolds in your in this kind of what you did section. Um, it's not, you don't have to do it all the time. I personally don't like the look of it very much, so I don't, but you definitely can if you want to highlight, you know, I did a uh, volunteer protect protection program, you know, you can bold that and make that like really stand out. Um, let's see. So let's go on to a few things that I noticed. So yes, we talked about the color and the bolding. Underlines and spacing is another thing. Uh, you'll see there is no gigantic white space anywhere on here. You, this is probably the most white space right here, and it's not too bad. There's also a bit here, but it's not, not terrible. So there's, there's, not, there's no corner or like weird in -pour, in inlet that's just totally white. Um, so that's what we're talking about, the spacing of white space and whatnot. Uh, you'll also notice there is pretty much just one bullet point per line. Uh, I think there's like one or two exceptions here and there, which is not terrible, but for the most point you do want to, most part you do want to keep about one bullet per line just to keep things concise. Also notice reverse chronological order. So for example, this is the thing that I did in 2017 that I should probably not have my resume anymore, but I keep putting it there. <laughs> and then I have this 2020 thing. This one I started in 2019, but I'm still in it. So I put it back towards the top. And this one I started in June, 2021. And um, I should change that because it's I'm not there anymore. But um, <laughs> so yeah, now that I'm not here, this one will actually drop below this one because this is what I'm currently doing. And this is something I'm not doing anymore. Uh, something you'll also notice is this is more of a personal choice. I am so involved in Aichi and did so many things with them that I just made a whole section for Aichi specifically. <laughs> if you are that involved in Aichi, feel free to do that. If you're not, you can just shove that in with your the rest of your relevant work experience. That's actually another good point, as I like to use the word relevant in my um, in my resumes because that indicates to the rec sorry recruiter that this is just your relevant work experience, not all of your work experience. And that's like a good just little mind trick that you can do. And then uh, you wouldn't 
know this because I don't have the um, job description with me, but these are specifically designed to meet the job description that I was applying for. And then we can notice some action verbs. So things like uh, update, promote, adapt, operate, synthesize, analyze, all those things. Um, so those are really strong action verbs. You did a thing, you know, it's very clear. It's not kind of wishy-washy. So things like that is very good. You also notice very few I statements, but I think I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, I don't actually, just kidding. <laughs> so you don't want to use I statements. You don't want to say I created or I used or anything like that. Just say, just say the verb. It'll save space. It'll save the recruiter like an extra microsecond of time, slightly more professional for some reason. So yeah. And then also one more thing that I wanted to point out at the top, again, my name is very big and this is all of the contact information I provide. There's no address, there's no phone number. I think if our career were to see this, this is how I would want them to contact me. So that's all that I put. So yeah, what questions do you have? Type them in chat, come off of mute, whatever you're comfortable with. What questions? Any questions? I'll give it like 30 seconds. Also, Hannah made a good point with the use of numbers. Um, I do try to put numbers in there if I can. Uh, like for here, I said I let, I supported five project teams, which is a total of 50 or more people. And then here it's a lead, lead a team of six people. So should we not put the address? Because I know some people have lived. Uh, I know some people have it and some don't, not sure. That's a great question. Um, I would recommend against it. I think because like I said, if you're if you're in an in-person career fair, there's a chance that maybe you'll drop your resumes or the recruiter will drop your resumes. Um, you, I, I personally don't want my address just out about in the world. I'm very protective about like where I live and who knows where I live. So I don't like to put it. If you're comfortable with just the general world and where you live, feel free to put it. Which programs have you used to create your resume? I use Google Drive. I know a lot of people use Microsoft Word and there are templates on LaTeX for it. I can't imagine writing my resume in LaTeX because it's so complicated and I love LaTeX. So that's a lot coming from me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is this one I make in Google Drive. And what I do actually, I can, I, mean, I shouldn't show you because it's like a lot of clicking, but anyways, what I do is I have, um, kind of one big resume that has all of the work experience and all of the potential like bullet points that I can use for it. And I just copy paste those into a different resume uh, that is just one page long. It's not everything that I ever did. And I just copy and paste the relevant things and adjust the language to a particular job thing, um, job description. So that's one trick you can do to just kind of organize everything. And I make a, a different resume for every single job that I apply for. That's something that you absolutely want to do. Different resume, every job. I also like to just update my resume every quarter. So every quarter I'll say something like, I'll make a copy and say, you know, resume fall 2021. And then I'll make copies based off of that one for the different jobs that I'm applying for. So I'll say resume fall 2021 and then that's the same. Thermo Fisher Leadership Development Program or something like that. So, that's how I organize it. You'll end up with, I recommend making a folder specifically for resumes somewhere in your drive or your documents or wherever you're keeping these because you're gonna have a lot of them by the end of your academic career. Opinion on the margins, great point. I'd say one inch because um, if you kind of squish it out to the edges, the recruiter's gonna be like, what is this? Like, why are they trying to get more stuff in here? I'm just trying to read this resume. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I don't know how recruiters think. So if you're feeling like pushing them back a bit, go for it. I'd say no, no more than one inch because if you squish it in and just there's a whole bunch of white space around the edge, that also doesn't look great. Any other questions? Okay. So we're going to do some workshopping. We're going to open some breakout rooms in a minute, but before we do that, we want to have people separate themselves into two groups. So the first group is that you already have a resume or multiple resumes and you want it to be critiqued. So this is people, uh, yeah, basically if you have a resume and you want it critiqued, you're going to go to any of the resume critiquing rooms and a volunteer will facilitate resume critiquing and we will have you switch rooms every once in a while so you can get different opinions and things like that. A reminder to volunteers is that if you 
are helping with a rosary critique, you don't have to be the only one critiquing. Everyone can help critique. So if you notice, you know, there's too much color there and the volunteer IT person doesn't help out, you can say that. Just say, I think that's too much color. All that stuff. If you don't have a resume ready or you have one that's like partially made, but you want help with it, you can go to any of the resume critique creating rooms. Any volunteer will be helping you one-on-one uh, -on -one to help you create a resume. It's kind of a long process, so we don't recommend switching rooms for this one, but I guess you could if you want to. Welcome back from breakout rooms. <laughs> this is the email you should email me at if you would like your resume critique at any point this year. Like I said, I will try to keep, I'll try to make some time to look at it. I can't promise a super thorough anything or within 24 hours, I'll try to get something. Else. Okay, so our upcoming events. Uh, we have a freshman transfer mixer tomorrow night at six o'clock. And we have our family preparing events on um, next Tuesday at six o'clock, which will be super exciting, be super much, super fun. I'm very excited. And then GBM number one is next Thursday. And we also have at the same bat time, same bat channel for anyone who knows some Batman references, we will be having a um, professional development workshop every Wednesday at five o'clock until week five, I believe, at which point we'll be having Niche, which is its own whole professional development. <laughs> so um, tune in at the same Zoom link every Wednesday at five o'clock. Next week is going to be elevator pitches. The back of that is going to be career fair 101. And then after that is going to be kind of like all your professional development answers. So anything that you want to talk about, we'll be there for it. So yeah, thank you for coming. If you would like to connect with us, please connect with us. Check out our link tree. It has our Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channel, which is where the recording of this will be posted. Uh, it has all of our websites and other things like that. So yeah, feel free to check us out. I'll be posting these slides somewhere, probably on Facebook and in our Discord. And yeah, have a good night, everyone.